Hi, welcome to session five. This is the pre-recorded session. Uh, we're now uh, just about two thirds of the way through the course. And the next session after this is going to be the showcase where you all share how you're going to coach or teach some of this material to others. In the last session, we focused on how to transition from a limbic brain that often operates from fear with right, wrong, or win-lose binaries to a more resourceful brain by intercepting thoughts before they result in actions. And then some combination of self-awareness, mindfulness, and positive constructive dialogue. In this session, we'll be working on strengthening the powers of the resourceful brain for ourselves and also for others. And we'll spend some time so you can organize what and how you will present in the last session. The, um, the two mindfulness exercises we have conducted so far have been on breath and on touch. And in this session, uh, the first page is, going to, is a uh, mindfulness exercise that directs our attention to relaxing different parts of the body. In the, in the practice of mindfulness, we reset our minds by focusing on sensations and by dismissing other intruding thoughts. When we are controlled by our limbic reactions, our conscious mind keeps up a dialogue to continue to focus our thoughts on what's troubling us. Mindfulness doesn't combat the, those thoughts. It replaces them with calmness. And as we get better at using mindfulness to reset our minds, we get better at gently pushing those thoughts away. Everyone who practices mindfulness has thoughts come up during the exercises. We learn to we learn to say things during our mindfulness practice, things like "not now" or "let me let me focus on mindfulness and I'll deal with this at, at, at another time," and then go back to the mindfulness exercise. So, um, so if you start experiencing other thoughts as you're doing the, these mindfulness exercises, don't get upset or don't get angry. The secret is to just calmly recognize that your thoughts have drifted and then just say, not now, or something like that, and then go back to mindfulness. And then we learned in the last session that mindfulness was one of the three tools of the self-commander, which is the mechanism we use to dissociate from saboteur behavior and tapped into our resourcefulness. So we're not going to do the mindfulness exercise here, but you have it. So that gives you three different mindfulness exercises that you can use uh, with your class or, or, or yourselves. So in also in the last session, uh, you know, we, we had a reflection exercise, you know, since the last, since that session, you've had the opportunity to catch yourself in limbic or saboteur mode and then use self-awareness, mindfulness, and or positive chatter, the tools of the self-commander, to reset your mind um, and see what happened. You also had the opportunity to do something with your class or one other person that helped them use one or more of these three methods and then describe what happened there. And just as you all... Um, uh, participate in, in classes, you know, I've asked you in the past to participate and to and to talk about your experiences here. Uh, because this is pre-recorded, what I've done is I've picked some of the lessons from previous classes and what pe people have said in those reflections. So the example, you know, catching yourself in limbic mode, intercepting and using the self-commander, uh, these were two of the responses. Uh, here's the first one. After reading lesson plans left for me to do a particular speech or reading lesson with ESL and struggling readers that lacked information for me to actually instruct and assess properly, I became distressed and angry that such obvious information would be missing in order to complete the lesson. Initially, I was frozen and at a loss for how to proceed. Limbic shutdown. I recognized the fight and freeze going on in my thinking and remembered the interceptor. The interceptor spoke to me and I began to question how I could use what was in my hands to review key parts of the speech lesson in a different way. I started hearing more constructive dialogue in my head, like maybe the kids can be the teachers. Maybe I can pose questions and they can show me what they know and therefore I can learn critical information to be used further. Maybe we can brainstorm sounds related to specific points of speech from words they know, and so on. The lesson became an affirmation for what they know, which hopefully resulted in positive feedback loop for them. And then here's, here's another one. I caught myself in limbic mode over the weekend, 
working to complete a task with my spouse, challenging project in which the frustration level rose, both of us saying, you don't see what I'm talking about. Tension level continued to raise. At that point, I asked myself, is there another way to make this work? I reset and we started the task over. This time we were able to complete it without tension. And then here's uh, two examples from using the self-commander to help others reset their minds. So here's the first one. We tried a mindfulness exercise in our high school class this morning. We used the mindfulness YouTube video to get us going, so it didn't feel like I was the one leading it. It helped settle the class and get them started in tutorials. I forgot how useful it is in getting students to relax and reset. And here's the second one. With the stress, this is with the stress of a leaking pipe. Before this class, I would have gone into my lizard brain and sunk. Saturday evening, I ran through all three methods to keep me from sinking. I stayed calm and detached from the situation as my husband ran through what we have to do to fix this, this problem. I spoke to him with clarity and used humor as we carried out our dialogue to determine the way we were going to get it fixed. I was self-aware of the skills I have and shared what I knew I could do and not do just as my husband did the same. It was weird but amazing how this stressful situation was, was handled with awareness, but there was no overwhelming feelings. And then the third task was to declare a sage focus for the, for the day. So again, here are two. First one, empathy. I greeted the school gate every morning, and I had a girl, and there was a girl with a quivering lip walk by. In the past, I would have just greeted her and moved on. But with a focus on empathy, I asked her what was happening, and she broke down in tears. We fixed the problem with the help of counselors and snacks. It was a nice moment. Her limbic brain was panicked for a variety of reasons. She forgot her gym clothes. She was exhausted from a tournament. She wanted to change classes. She was hungry, etc. Later in the day, I could see her happy and smiling, and that felt great. And then here's the second one. I recently got a pretty big grant to build an outdoor classroom for my school garden program, and we have a tight timeline to start taking action and spending the funds. I've been feeling a lot of self-doubt about moving the project forward in the right way and feeling out of my depth in decision-making, so I declared a focus on innovation as I met with the rest of my garden committee and admin to chart out our path forward. It helped me be open to learning from the expertise of others and thinking about different ways my priorities could look as could look as an outcome. By bringing to the forefront all the things I needed to find out, I could be a lot more listening to others and hearing their ideas without trying to supersede them with my own plans. So hopefully you've all had uh, similar experiences you know, as, as you tried those three exercises. And let me share my screen and move on. So uh, here we go to the PowerPoint and... Okay, so um, here we are in session five. Um, here is the mindfulness exercise uh, dealing with re relaxing different parts of the body, um, talking about the reflection, and then play, curiosity, and exploration. Mindfulness is a very strong tool to reset the brain. Even if we are extremely upset angry or fearful whenever we sense our minds drifting to whatever is troubling us if we take 10 15 minutes or even less to devote our attention to the here and now and where and we gently come back to the mindfulness practice we can restore our ability to be resourceful curious and playful when the brain is reset we effectively remove the elements of fear and anxiety this allows our survival mind to release its hold that controls our prefrontal cortex and to actively, actively engage that part of our brains. When this happens, we experience a sense of play, curiosity, and exploration. And the way the limbic system engages the limbic cortex and allows it to do its thing is by, re is by releasing the joyful hormones of serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, and endorphins. Those hormones 
amplify and engage our sage, sage minds to use the sage powers of empathy, connecting with others, exploring and evaluating, innovating, setting and aligning to goals, and committing to action with a commitment to overcome anticipated and unanticipated obstacles, even when we don't fully know. In fact, we never fully know how we're going to succeed. You've had a chance to, to go deeper into each one of these powers in the reading. Now, in addition to the five sage powers, Shirzad Shamin also introduces something he calls the sage perfect perspective and what Phil Stutz calls radical acceptance. So first, here's a quick summary of the five sage powers. You know, empathize, visualize the person, and that person could be you, yourself, as well as another person. So visualize the person as someone who is being terrorized by saboteurs, and your mission is to find out how they feel and what they need. Explore. Be curious about what has happened and what will happen without being attached to any results. Innovate. When the obvious or traditional ways aren't working, encouraging and building on other people's ideas to create something new. Navigate. Using a consistent internal compass, what's important, what would your wiser, older self say to do? And activate, being prepared to be in flow, especially when obstacles appear and your saboteurs or part X start playing with your motivation. The reading discussed one way of using these powers as part of the self-commander. And you can use that at the beginning of a day or at as you're approaching virtually any situation, you can make a personal declaration that you are or you're going to use any one of these powers. It turns out that focusing on one of the powers is often more effective than just saying, I'll use the sage powers to solve the issue. And it also turns out that since the powers really are related by focusing on one, you'll end up using whatever is appropriate. Don't spend a lot of time mulling over which one to to declare, just pick one and ask yourself, using the sage power of whichever one you picked, how could I bring a sense of curiosity and play to the situation? So I hope that that's further clarification on the five sage powers, and let's move on to the sage perspective. The sage perspective, or what Stutz calls radical acceptance, is about treating things that go wrong as a potential gift or opportunity. Our minds often catastrophize things that did or might go wrong. The sage perspective allows us to accept negative or unforeseen events or outcomes and move on or even use them as motivators. Dr. Stutz says that radical acceptance is finding the strength to say, what am I going to do about this now? When you look at all events as having value, you're in the zone of tremendous opportunity. If you think about it, most of the things we get upset about aren't going to make any difference to our lives in the long run. Shamin says that you can go by the Pareto rule, which says that only 20% of the things that affect us make 80% of the difference which also means that 80% of the things that affect us really don't make much of a difference. If we can let go of that 80% that are unimportant, we can ensure that the important ones get done. As you feel fear, fear or anxiety or regret building, you can ask yourself, in 10 years, is this going to seem important or not? Is this part of the 80%? Or is this part of the 20%? If it's in the 80% that is not going to seem important in 10 years, just let it go. By concentrating on the 20%, you're going to have a much greater chance of achieving whatever it is that you want to. Remember in the last session, we talked about the fact that you cannot just disappear on unhelpful story or script. Using the Pareto rule, we say, instead of dwelling on this, What's something more impactful in my life that I can focus on and just let this one go? The other method of Shamin and Stutz is to look for the good in any event. We can ask yourselves, how is this a long-term gift? First, what can I learn? Second, what can I practice? Or third, 
What is this prompting me to do? If you're teaching a lesson and it doesn't well go well, you could say, well, I just learned something that didn't work. Or maybe you learned something about yourself or your students. Those would be examples of what can I learn? Learning is a gift. Or you could say, I just got a chance to practice, and now I think next time I'll do better. Which would be, what can I or did I practice? Either of these shift your attention from dwelling on the gap between what you wanted to happen and the actual results to how the process of what you did or about to do helped make you more capable or stronger. Practicing a skill is also a gift. The third type of gift is choosing to do something. You might say, that didn't work out, but let's use this as, as an example, and we can get a bunch of teachers together to figure out how to teach this better, and the whole school would be better off. That example would be prompting you to the action of pulling together other teachers to discuss this type of problem. Doing something for yourself or for others is a third gift. Now, what you decide to do when you get triggered by some bad result can relate directly to what you were trying to do, as in pulling other teachers together, you know, it helps you teach better. But what you decide to do doesn't have to relate directly to what, what your goal was and in, in, in whatever the action was that didn't work out. You can use an unwelcome result as a reason to do something completely unrelated. Now, this last one is a little hard to visualize, so I'm going to give you an example. Um, I, I love to buy wine, but my wife has said we have too much wine, so I shouldn't buy any more for quite a while. And she's probably right, as always, but I really do love to buy wine. Now, where this comes into play is that sometimes she'll do things that really piss me off, like... I'll put an important piece of paper on the dining room table and she'll just throw it out. And I won't find out for a day or so until I really need it. And when I say something, she'll just matter of factly say, Hey, if you, if you wanted it, you shouldn't have left it on the table. And as you can guess, that used to make me really angry and we go downhill from there. Or, you know, she might do any of the things one spouse does that annoys the other one. We all have them and we all do it. Well, I used to get really upset when anything like that happened. But now when it happens, I just say to myself, okay, she's just giving you permission to buy another six bottles of wine. I don't get angry for long. I don't dwell on it. I get to do something I love, problem solved, and I get to move on. So this example shows that instead of focusing on our anger, fear, or anxiety, we can use some negative results as an excuse to do something that will make us very happy. Think, think of something that you really love that you don't normally do for yourself. Like, oh, that class didn't turn out well, but now I'm going to buy myself a new pair of shoes. You know, probably not something expensive, just something that you wouldn't ordinarily allow yourself to do or have. When the next bad thing happens, wouldn't doing that turn your feelings around? The sage perspective, or the three gifts, can be used in retrospect, or it could be used looking ahead. Looking at something that already happened, we did something, and it didn't work out. We can use a sage perspective to look for what we learned. We can look for what it gave us a chance to practice, or we can use that to inspire us to take action in some way. Now, looking ahead we face times when we're anxious or fearful about doing something. There's some fear that it's not going to work out, which our limbic system interprets as a danger and then floods us with reasons to fight, flee, or maybe freeze. Using the sage perspective, we can look ahead and decide about whether or not that whether or not we achieve what we want, we can choose what we are going to learn or whether or not we achieve what we want just the practice is going to increase our abilities. Or we can say, hmm, if this doesn't work out, I'm going to do X, which is the silver lining.
With the sage perspective, we can see that we have three choices whenever something did not turn out the way we expected. And also whenever we attempt something that might not that might not turn out the way we expected. By default, we tend to languish in regret over the past or anxiety about the future. You know, why did this happen to me? Things always go bad. This will never work out. I just can't do this. But we actually have two more choices. Over time, we probably would make one of these two choices anyhow. You know, something bad happens. You know, we may dwell on it for a day or a week or even a year. But at, but at some point, we move on. Time heals all wounds, right? We don't have to wait for the time. We can make these choices right away. We don't have to wait for a year. We can just accept it. We can say, in a year, this really isn't going to make a difference. Anyhow, it's really not important. I'm just going to concentrate on the 20% of things that are really important and just let it go. Or we can convert it into a gift or op opportunity. What did we learn? Or what will we learn if this, do if this doesn't work out? What did we get a chance to practice? Or what will we be able to practice even if this doesn't work out? How am I going to reward myself? Or how will I use this to improve for the future? Those are the two ways of moving to resourceful mode, acceptance or conversion. And we can actively choose to use one of them in order to, uh, in order to lessen our anxiety and lessen our regret. So normally, if this were a live class, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd have you work in a in, in small groups and, uh, you know, you'd have a chance to try this with some problem like um, a lesson um, that didn't work out or uh, an extra responsibility. Um, but, you know, because this was pre-recorded, um, you know, maybe you can use one of these as an example of a, you know, of the lesson plan that you're going to be developing but you know or or just think through take take a second put the put this video on on hold and take a look at these questions and just think about how you might be able to use the sage perspective or one of the five sage powers in order to to handle these situations but let's move on Once the primitive mind has been quieted, you are freer to tap into the resourcefulness of your creative mind, which are the five powers plus one more tactic that we're calling the sage perspective or gifts or silver linings. Trace back a second through what happens that puts us into a react mode and eventually into a resourceful mode. Generally, some event, which could have been a person, you know, triggered some reaction in our limbic minds that created some type of fear or anxiety, our limbic minds probably settled on some type of action, perhaps a, a saboteur action, which we reflectively would have followed. Through self-awareness, we intercepted that action, realizing that it was just a reaction. We then used our self-commander to reset our minds so that we are in a playful, exploratory mode and open to critical thinking and creativity. There are an infinite number of things we can say to ourselves to get us moving in a constructive path once we realize that we don't have to follow our survival brain. Here are six types of questions that correspond to the five powers and the gifts. One thing we can do is focus on empathy for the person we're interacting with. You perhaps ask how you can connect with that person. You can take the time and effort to find out what that person really means or really wants. A second is that you can focus on learn, learning more before coming up with an action. What are other do, others doing? What background information could be helpful? What can you try before committing to any one permanent action? Or discuss how you can jointly learn more with other people. A third is that you can stop yourself from dismissing other people or other ideas and come up with something to, to say to go into a more collaborative mode rather than win-lose or right-wrong. For example, the trick I often use is to start with what I really like about your suggestion is, and then say something good about what they suggested, and then say, and what that triggers in me is the possibility that, and then add something to their idea. 
This is a way to add to what other people are saying rather than to disagree with other people are saying and go into more confrontational mode. A fourth is that you can focus on what's really important. This could be just getting letting go of some trauma or disagreement to avoid wasting time fighting battles that aren't going to make a difference. So you can focus on what's really important. Or it could be working with others to come up with overriding values or goals that you can all work together to achieve. Letting go means I can argue with my wife about who left the cabinet open, or I can just close the cabinet door and spend time on things that just give both of us joy. One of the reasons we've been married for 36 years is because we don't get into long arguments about the small stuff. A fifth is you can go over different possibilities for action and actively choose one that excites you instead of just doing something because you feel you have no other choices. And in choosing an action, you can also envision how you're going to stick with it, even if it doesn't seem to be working at first. Thinking through how you're willing to overcome the inevitable obstacles, the naysayers, or overcome your own brain when it tell, when it starts telling you, see, I told you this, was, this isn't going to work. And by thinking through in advance how you're going to react to those situations, you're going to be more likely to persist. And then sixth, you can look for the silver lining. We often catastrophize what's going to happen if we're not successful, but we can also choose to look for the gifts. Hey, if things don't work out, what can I learn? What skills will I have practice? Or what can I do next to make up for it? So if you think about it, those first five types of constructive dialogues play into the five sage powers that Shahzad Shamin talks about, empathy, exploration, innovation, higher purpose or navigation, and laser-focused action, while the sixth question relates to what he calls the sage or growth mindset. For each of these capabilities, take them too far or twist them, and they can co-opt your ability to think or be resourceful. This is part of the genius of Shahzad Shamin's PQ movement and what you can find out yourself if you want to take the free assessment on Coach Robbie's uh, website. You can find out you know, which, which of these saboteurs um, are most active in your own minds. When we're in sage mode, we take information and feedback you know, as it comes and use it to consistently improve our skills and move towards our life goals. There's no good or bad. There's just information. We also have this judge or part X that exists in our limbic brains. And that's what sorts everything into good, bad, and it's fueled by anxiety and fear. When we start getting good at any one of the powers of the sage mind, part X or the judge can twist our strengths and keep us safe, but also prevent us from being resourceful and reaching our higher goals. The master saboteur is judgment based on some fear. The judge finds fault with everything, with ourselves, with others, and with circumstances. And then the judge manifests in different ways for each individual, especially in areas where we're especially proficient. For example, look at that first power, empathy. You know, it's an advantage to seek first to connect with another person, to understand them and what they want, and even try to help them, and not to immediately try to control or dismiss them. Dismiss them. If that's something you're good at, the judge twists that into a hyper-pleaser saboteur. With a hyper-pleaser, you're taking a lens of always trying to please other people, but you do it from the fear that if you do or say or don't do or say certain things, they won't like you. Therefore, you're pleasing them to try to make an effect on them rather than pleasing them just because it's a strength of yours. You may manifest this in not talking candidly to people in order to avoid conflict, in which case you are merely avoiding conflict instead of working to resolve it, or to feel that you need to defer to others because if you don't, they won't like you and will sabotage, you know, and these, these will um, sabotage your efforts to grow and achieve. 
Empathy is the power, but codependency or overpleasing can be saboteurs. And there are similar saboteurs for each of the sage powers. One advantage of exploration is gathering information and not being locked into the solution too early. The judge may twist this so that you move from thing to thing without completing anything based on possibly fear of missing out. Or it may twist exploration so that you're always trying to get more information and never moving into action because you're afraid that you may miss something. So, you know, that if you miss something, something bad is going to happen. An advantage of innovation is that you and, and the people you're with synthesize solutions that none of you could have come up with on your own. If that's something that you're good at, the judge can twist this with the fear that no one else can come up with a solution as good as yours, so that only you can do something well. You know, that 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 then becomes a saboteur trait in your limbic mind. Oh, I have to come up with something new, um, and only I can do it. Thinking about what's most important to you can help you direct your focus to the things that will make the biggest difference. But your judge can twist that so that you rationalize dropping projects early because they were really not that important or worth the effort, or that you were not good enough to warrant the result. Or it can twist that to convince you that bad things always happen to you and you can't ever reach what you want, so you might as well give up. Or you can be viewed, you know, by doing this, you're often viewed as judgmental. And then voluntary committing to a plan that allows you to overcome obstacles can put you in a state of flow, but your judge can twist that, that same planning ability to insist that only you have to micromanage and criticize everyone and they won't measure up, or that you are so fearful about what might go wrong that you don't end up taking action. And we've probably all seen that in ourselves to a certain extent. So as you look at, at this chart, you know, start thinking about, you know, your sage powers, which are really strengths, and start understanding that, hey, when you have the saboteur, sometimes just call it out. Oh, gee, I'm just doing this to please, I'm being hyper pleaser. How do I use the empathy as a strength? Um, and and maybe reset or 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 take three or four minutes of, of mindfulness? Or am I just moving from, you know, uh, am I exploring? Or yeah, am I just moving from thing to thing, or am I avoiding action by just looking at information? So take a take a few minutes, reset, and then say, well, you know, and then move into one of the, one of the other powers. So we've been focusing on how our brains are most re resourceful. And we can contrast that with how our limbic brain sometimes sabotages our best interests. There, there are five powers that we've been talking about um, that our resourceful brain possesses. And when we contrast that with, um, with how our, our limbic brain might, op might operate, uh, start with empathy. You know, when we're working with others, we often find ourselves in conflict. When we're resourceful, we pay especially close attention to finding out what they are thinking and what they want, which often leads to collaboration instead of conflict. Exploration. In limbic mode, we naturally ignore information, information which conflicts with what we have already decided. When we're, when we're in resourceful mode, we're looking for more information with curiosity and a sense of play. Innovation. In limbic mode, we come up with some idea and then defend it while negating the su suggestions of others with yes, but. When we're resourceful, we build on others' ideas with yes, and, or what I like about that is, and something else we might consider, we might consider is whatever. With navigation, in limbic mode, we lower our goals so that we don't have risks or don't get hurt. In resourceful mode, we keep our eyes on what's really important, perhaps, perhaps by calling on our wiser, older self, or imagining what we would have regarded as important at the end of our lives. And then with focused action, in limbic mode, obstacles cause us to give up, and we let our saboteurs come up with reasons that's okay. In resourceful mode, we anticipate how obstacles or our saboteurs will lie to us, 
and why about why we should give up and we proceed with the detachment of a champion who welcomes challenges who welcomes challenges as you stress which we've talked about earlier in addition to the five powers we can often jump out of blaming others in events or victimhood by adopting the sage perspective which is that whatever happens there will be gifts or opportunities either we're going to learn something um, or we'll have had the opportunity to practice, or we'll do something meaningful and gratifying at the end of it. If we are afraid or anxious about some challenge or some task we're about to do, we can sometimes unlock our resourceful powers by looking for the gifts or opportunities, even if things were not to turn out the way we expect. We have also looked at how our minds sometimes turn our strengths against us to protect us from risk or danger. People who are really able to relate to others when they go overboard have this fear that if they don't please others, then others won't like them. It's a strength to be able to anticipate what others want. It's a blessing to do things for other people. But when the motivation is that we have to do it, the motivation is coming from fear and will interfere, interfere with what's in our best interest. People who are good at researching and exploring for information may develop a fear that unless they keep looking for information, nothing is going to work out. That would be the avoider saboteur. Notice the difference between looking for information from curiosity or a sense of play and looking for information because of a fear that you have to. Or people who are good at exploring may be constantly exploring, looking for the next new shiny thing. And that would be the restless saboteur, afraid of missing out. People who are good at innovating may always be looking at the next accomplishment, always dissatisfied with what they or others have done, or always insisting that their ideas win. Those would be examples of the hyperachiever who's afraid that nothing is ever good enough. People who are good at goal setting may rationalize why their goal is right and their methods of achieving their goals are right. That would be a hyper-rational saboteur. Or they may set goals, and when things don't work out, they may play the victim. And people who are very competent may feel that they have to control or do everything themselves. Their hyper-controller saboteur would be filling them with the fear that things would be terrible, terribly wrong if they didn't control everything. Or they might feel they had to have a plan that takes into account every single thing that could possibly go wrong before they move forward to action. And that would be hypervigilant. The, we, the reasons why we went through these and are reviewing them now is not for you to memorize them, although they will be on the test. Just kidding. No test. The reason is to give you more tools to recognize saboteur behavior both in yourself and in others. And you know that you can't reason yourself or others out of saboteur behavior the way we or anyone else gets out of these saboteurs' behaviors is first, by intercepting it, by being aware of it. Second, using the self-commander to give yourself enough space to start moving into a resourceful direction so that we can be aware of what's happening uh, maybe do a mindfulness practice and or talk to ourselves to get into a better frame of mind. And third, actively using one of the five sage powers or the sage pers perspective in a playful, curious way in order to move forward. So I'm hoping that that summary should help cement a lot of what we've covered in these five sessions and that this course has been very helpful for you. And so now what I'd like to do is just cover a little bit about um about the showcase sessions so between now and the next session um you should prepare a lesson and that lesson can be something that you would do with students or that something you or somebody else could do with co-workers family members um peers you know you know some adults or or, or some other kids any way that you would teach one or more of the concepts that were covered in this course to somebody else so that they could start practicing them. So um, I'm going to go to this this link in a moment, but there's a um, there's a 
there's a PowerPoint that has lessons that I've developed and I've, I've given them to you in emails. I'm going to give them to you in, in, in this email as, as well. Uh, but there's a PowerPoint that contains lessons that I've done and also at the end of it, lessons that other um, other teachers have done. And I'm going to show that to you in a second. And then um, and then you're going to write your lesson and you can write your lesson using practically anything. You could use uh, Word, pro you know, Word, Word processor. You could use Google, um, Google Documents. You could use Google Presents or um, you could use PowerPoint uh, and then put that into a place where other people can access it by putting it into the spread into the spreadsheet and I'll link to the show you the spreadsheet also but here's a here's a link to the spreadsheet on the on this page um, and when you go into that spreadsheet there's a tab and uh, that tab has lessons that are created by other educators and you can use those um, as the basis for your own lesson um, or you could also use those with your class if 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 you find that helpful to you. And then if you do your lesson, but you don't know how to share it with others, if you can email your lesson to me, I can put it into a public place and I can share it on the spreadsheet for you. Once you have the lesson, you're going to explain it to other people in the class, and you can choose to do that on either May 23rd or May 25th. It's the same Zoom link that we've been using for everything. Um, and uh, we'll start off May 23rd. The people who want to go May 23rd uh, can present then and we'll record it. And um, the other people uh, will be presenting on May 25th. And, you know, you can attend one um, or uh, or they're fun. So you may want to attend both of them. Um, and during those lessons, um, you know, we'll all be reacting to the lesson plans and um, thinking about how we can use them in, in, in our own lives and, and to work with other people. So let me uh, stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to get out of PowerPoint. And uh, let me go to Lessons for Younger Students. So when you follow that link and you download the existing lessons PowerPoint, um, what you get and let me go back to uh, sharing my screen again. Uh, what you get is is uh, this. Let me. I'll, I'll expand it a little bit. Make it a little bit bigger. Okay. Uh, you get um, this PowerPoint: Mind Shifting Growth. Mindsets and habits of mind, and you know the first twelve lessons are lessons that I've done and I've used with uh, middle school students. And if you take a look, um, this lesson, um, this this lesson. Um, here okay which is the after the introduction um is basically the same exercise we did when we first got started uh we start off with a transition uh we start off with a quote and discussion and i've put uh you know instructions for an instructor here and then you know this slide ha should look very familiar because it's the same slide that that we used in the class um i can't do this um and uh you know asking for a volunteer to go through that have uh um asking for uh e explaining what happens when you say perhaps i can to yourself and how your mind shifts and then um an exercise where the students do this in in pairs um and uh, you know instructions for a discussion afterwards uh then uh, a discussion of um you know well where could you apply this okay and uh you know here's some situations uh and then talk about the internal negative talk that that the students have had when they were in situations like that and what what are some positive potential internal talk that they could have used when they when they fear anger how could they talk to themselves about getting out of anger how could they talk to themselves when they're thinking of putting things off etc and then um and then getting some type of commitment from them. Okay, so now that you've tried these, you know, how are you going to try these over the next day or so? Um, and then kind of um, going back to the quote, um, 
now that they've had this experience, how does this quote then uh, relate to them? So, so just going back to the beginning, so that was this lesson two, how do you know you can't do that? And then at the back of it, and I'm just going to uh, click on that link here, okay, on the back, on the last slide um, are, you know, some examples of teacher lessons. And um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this one, um, Riley Roach's The Power of Yet. And so I'm going to uh, stop share for a minute. And uh, I'll go to the power of yet. Okay. And now I'll share the screen. Okay. And, you know, here's, um, you know, Riley Roach's uh, lesson that, that she created about the power of yet and the, and the growth mindset. So, I mean, she used a lot of graphics. You can, um, uh, she used some external resources. So she has a go noodle activity here, um, uh, which is uh, a mindfulness exercise. And then um, there's another video on uh, how Katie learns the power of yet um, and in terms of how can I change my thinking. And then she um, relates it to the students themselves. You know, how would you do if you're stuck on a, on a project or a math problems or worksheet questions? Think of a time you were afraid to ask for help. Um, you know, how, what could you diff do differently next time? Um, and then um, has a read aloud uh, book, the magic, uh, the magic of yet. Uh, and then at the end of that, what are some things you didn't know how to do, but you do now? So, so have the students think back to their own accomplishments. And then, um, you know, a link to uh, a, a, some dojo discussion guides for the teachers. And then, um, letting the, the students and the teachers know what, what she's going to cover next. So I think that's a pretty good example of, um, you know, somebody putting together a, a lesson plan and, you know, it's only in this case, eight slides, uh, but I, but it's very powerful. It probably would last, a, it, it would last a, a full class period. So, um, so uh, I hope that that uh, clarifies for you all, um, you know, what to do in terms of putting to a lesson plan as I mentioned before, you don't have to do this on your own. If there's, if there's another person that you know in the class, uh, the two of you can come together and produce a, a lesson plan together. Uh, the purpose of this is just to affirm um, something that you've learned and to be able to share resources with other people in the class so that this material um, becomes available to uh, and accessible to more and more people. So... Um, I guess that's the 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 end of my part of uh, of mindfulness one. Uh, I hope that this material really helps you in your own lives, um, and I hope that you can use this material to help students learn how to control their own brains better. Uh, this is mindfulness one. Uh, we'll re be repeating this course um, in September, um, so that if you know teachers or educators who you think would want to take this class in September, they can sign up with Tammy. And then in October, November, we'll have the Mindfulness 2 class. And then in January, uh, we'll have the Mindfulness 3 class. Uh, the Mindfulness 2 class um, goes more into how to react to situations using the powers of the mind. And uh, the Mindfulness 3 class goes more into how do we interact with other people now that we understand situations and we understand our own minds how do we get other people how do we help other people access their own creativity and resourcefulness so um so i'll see you in the showcase lessons and um thank you very much